know sometimes we just have to settle some things in our spirit because sometimes we've been lied to for so long that it's hard to unbelieve a lie that we were raised up in in this world we have a perceived freedom but we find out that as we live our life that that freedom that we say men died for that that freedom that we pledge our allegiance to that that freedom has has a short leash and it's not truly freedom and we give everything for it. We pay taxes for it. But we find out that we can't go where we want to. That we can't open doors when we want to. That the restrictions can come in when they want to. But they told us that was freedom. But in the kingdom where we have true freedom for where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty. We operate with a perceived bondage. So we call the world's bondage freedom and we have true freedom in the kingdom and have this perceived bondage somewhere we believed that fear could hold us down. Somewhere we believed that sickness belonged in our body. Somewhere we believed that depression was a thing that was normal. Somewhere we believed that our sin would keep us out of the presence of God. Somewhere we believed that our yesterday would make God angry with us today. And we operate in a bondage that does not exist. That if you would just step forward, you know, there ain't a cage big enough to hold you. I can walk through the entire scripture and I can see where they tried to put Joseph in a pit, but they couldn't keep him there. So they tried to put him in a prison and they couldn't keep him there where they tried to put Jonah in a fish, but he called out to God and God heard him from the belly of the fish. I can find where they tried to lock up Saul or Paul and Silas, but they sang out at midnight and all the chains fell off and all the doors opened. I can find where the grave tried tried to hold you and tried to hold me, but Jesus took the keys from sin and death and kicked the door right open that there is no bondage, that there is no chain, that there is no holding you. And if you would understand that and lift up your voice and lift up your hands, that in atmospheres of worship where two or three are gathered, there he is and where the Spirit of the Lord is. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Somebody just take a moment and shake your chains off. Somebody take a moment and shake the chains off. Father, we love you. You are holy. You are holy, 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 God. You are worthy. There's none like you. We love you, God. We adore you. We lift your name on high, God. We exalt your name. We extol your name. We magnify your name in this place. We say there is no God but you. You are the true and living God. Father, we fall at your feet. We say have your way. We say overflow in this place. Spring up rivers of living water. Spring up rivers of living water from the inside, God. Holy Ghost, fill every dry place. Fill every empty place. Shine your light, God, into every dark corner. Draw us unto you, God. Speak a truth to our heart. God, change us from the inside. Circumcise our hearts today in your presence. Don't let us leave the same. Father, I pray for an anointing that makes preaching easy, but an anointing that destroys yokes, an anointing that lifts burdens, 
Father, let your anointing for healing be in this place. Your anointing for salvation be in this place. Your anointing for deliverance be in this place. In Jesus' name, I take authority over the atmosphere. I command everything that is not of God to leave this place in the name of Jesus. I speak to every infirmity, every spirit of fear, every pride, every divination in Jesus' name, every spirit of rebellion and witchcraft, every oppression. You have no authority in this place. And I declare that the word of the Lord will go out and accomplish what it is set forth to do. It won't return void in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody shout to God. God is good. And the devil is a liar. All the time, every day. We get a devil so much grace that maybe this time he ain't lying so much. <laughs> the devil is a liar all the time. some scripture I'm going to run through. We're going to get in this word and we're going we to chase after the Lord. How about that? 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18 to 31. It says this, and this is my favorite verse in the Bible, verse 18 here. It says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. God chose the foolishness of preaching. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh. The New King James Version, which is what this is, says, for you see your calling, uh, which also translates, consider your calling. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that is as it is written he who glories let him glory in the Lord I'm going to read seven verses out of Revelation chapter 3 the book of Revelation chapter 3 and then I'm going to read one verse out of Mark it says this in verse 14 and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich in white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye sap that you may see as many as I love I rebuke and chasten therefore be zealous and repent 
Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then Mark 16, 20 says, and they went forth and preached everywhere. Where they preach at? Somewhere. Here and there. Just at their dining room table. Just in church. They went forth and they preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. You know, we get that, that warning in the book of Revelation about being lukewarm. We talk about being lukewarm. I would say every church likes to quote that about being lukewarm, be hot or cold, this, that, or the other. But if you ever really sit and consider the danger of being lukewarm, is that we live in a world that needs a hot believer. Uh, we, need, we, we live in a world that needs... Freedom. We live in a world that needs to hear the gospel for salvation. We leave, live in a world that needs deliverance. We live in a world that needs healing. We need, live in a world where, where people are being held down by all kinds of stuff and being bound up by all kinds of stuff. And unless we preach the truth, then they stay in it. Um, being hot or cold is good because if, at least if someone is cold, you can't trick nobody. If you're hot... And if this one's hot and this one's cold and there is no middle ground, then no one gets deceived to think that they can live for God in the middle. The danger of thinking you can live for God in the middle of a thing is that because it sounds godly, people feel like they've accomplished something. Because it's, it, it, it sounds like something that, that makes me feel better, but I really don't have to change if I'm living in the middle of a thing. This is where Scripture says that they got a form of godliness, but know not the power thereof. What is the point in having a form of godliness without the power? Right. Who wants to live in a form of godliness without the power? That means you get the tribulation of God with no power. You get the persecution that they put on Jesus with no power. You get the rejection that they gave Jesus, but no power. Uh, and you sit there and you're turning the other cheek and you're getting life beat out of you. But you got no power. This middle ground. So people come here thinking that they can find the things that are promised in the hot. And they never manifest in the middle. So these people never believe the hot. There's a, there's a danger. I told our team, our ministerial team, I was talking to them in a meeting a couple of weeks ago, and I was just talking about social media, how social media is. You know, everyone wants a social media presence. Who, who's on Facebook? Who's on Instagram? TikTok, Snapchat, Twitter, True Social. <laughs> who, who ain't on nothing? Bless you. Bless you in the name of the Lord. The, the, may the Lord be with you. You are holy. You, let me tell you something. Learn from me. That's what put a sign and say, learn from me. <laughs> who in the metaverse already? Not here. All right, so, so. But everybody wants some type of presence. They have sold this presence to our children that our children can make livings and become influencers and make money doing nothing. So, so it, it circumvents the work that you want to do as a parent to teach your children work hard and, and it'll pay off in the end. If you work hard later on, you can play hard. But our children look into the world then, social media presence, they just want to play hard all the time and get paid for it. You're not an athlete, right? You want to work. So, so, so we got this social media presence, and and you know what happens is if you don't post every single day, you lower your standings. If you don't post every day, you lower your standings in the algorithm. So if you go a week without posting and then you post something, no one sees it. 
So you got to make sure you stay on top of posting. Make sure you post something else. Put your grits and eggs on there. Put your, put your, your, your outfit of the day on there. Uh, uh, take 30 selfies and pick which one you like the best and put it on there. Scroll back through your photos and find an old happy picture of your family and put it on there because the day y'all arguing, right? <laughs> and, so, and so you put, and act like it's new because you never used it before. And, and we do this to keep our, our presence there so that we don't go lower in our standings. Um, I told the team, I said, if you were to go on a cruise, this is how the day usually looks for people who go on a cruise. Uh, they, they get up and they're packing their stuff or have packed it and they're putting pictures up saying, getting ready to go on vacation, <laughs> vacation, or whatever, you know. <laughs> they put this stuff out and then they get down to the port while we in worship because they, they dock that boat at 8 in the morning or 9 in the morning, and they leave at 4. People don't think that they can come to worship and then go get on the boat. They got to go down there and worship at the altar of a carnival or a Norwegian and get down there. Because they got to be the first one with the smoked salmon off the buffet. They get down there in front of the boat while they're walking in. Family photo, bam, post, see y'all next week, right? Uh, they get, they get uh, in there with their passport, put it up. They get in the boat, put their breakfast up, sitting here off the water. Then you get a picture of everything, three outfits a day, captain's dinner, over here at the bingo, playing bingo. Here's video at the pool, you know. Uh, here's my Bahama Mama uh, drink, boom, uh, whatever. Bragging how they emptied the wine bottles and put the Hennessy in it and recorked it to take it on the, on the cruise. Talking about cruise hacks. And, then, and, and buy the internet package so they can post on social media, right? Not so work can reach them, not so the family can get to them, but so they can post on social media. And they post all day, and then after the trip, got to do a photo dump, one last photo dump. Got to dump everything you ain't seen yet. And I said to the team, I said, I said, we see this. I said, when's the last time you seen any person do that for the kingdom? See, we, 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 we always disassociate ourselves from what we call lukewarm. We define it the way we want to so that we don't fit inside of it. But when's the last time anyone that you know lived like that for the kingdom? Got up this morning, all blessings to God. He woke me up, started me on my way. Boom. Right? Here, here's what I'm meditating on. Here's what's in my spirit. Make sure you get to church. Photo dump of worship or whatever. Don't take pictures during worship. Worship. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying, right? Don't nobody even know you go to church. Or you might post once a week. You know, Resurrection Sunday just passed. And, and, and there, was, there, there wasn't cruise-type pictures posted. It's quiet in this Methodist church. <laughs> if you're here for the first time, we're not Methodist. That's the surprising part. So, 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 so we get this, this idea then of what is lukewarm when we step away from it. But there is a picture of hot. The Bible says uh, there in Mark 16 that the Lord was working with them. They were preaching the gospel everywhere, and the Lord working with them, these signs followed their preaching, confirming the word. The reality of it is the Lord goes with you. The Lord goes with you, working with you. It's not about your personality. It's not whether or not people like you. It's not about if you have the right things to say. The Lord works with you. If you're going to preach his word, he ain't got to work with you to preach your word. You know, the Lord ain't got to work with you because you talk promotion and retirement. He ain't got to work with you if you talk economics. But he does work with you when you preach his gospel. And then his signs follow that, that if we release a word, He'll confirm that word in that person through things in their life or even in the moment. Someone that you told God will do this for you, and then you leave, and then when God does it, they remember the word they were told. God works with you. He never leaves you, the scripture says. He never forsakes you, the scripture says. He doesn't send us out like sheep among the wolves to be slaughtered, but he makes us more than conquerors, scripture says because they can't take us from his love. So there's really no reason to operate in some type of way where we're alone or where we're in fear or where we can't move forward the way he tells us to. 
It says this, it says he stands at the door and he knocks. And if anyone hears his voice and opens up to him, uh, then he'll come in and sup with them. He's ready to come in to whoever opens. Y'all, people don't preach the gospel, and I you know I'm saying preach, but I'm not talking about preaching like this. But people don't minister the gospel to people because they don't believe that God will go in there. That's what you're saying. I can't tell you this because I don't believe God's going to go in there. I don't believe that you're going to hear his voice, and I don't believe that you're going to open up to him. So I'm going to hold this to myself, and I'm going to give it to someone that I think will hear it. The problem with that, then, is you only talk about the gospel to other Christians at other churches and tell them not about Jesus, but about how good your church is. If they know the Lord, I ain't got to tell them about the Lord. They should be telling others about the Lord, and he should be working with them. Um, this, is, this is salvation to all who open to him. It's up to everyone. And you know that there are two at the door. Is the problem with the door. There's two at the door. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. And if anybody hears my voice and opens up, I'm going to come sup with them. But he also, God also said in Genesis chapter 4, he said, Cain, why are you downcast? He says, sin lies at the door. And it desires to have you. So you must master it. So you got Jesus standing there knocking. And sin lies there desiring, scheming, waiting for the door to crack and come in like a fly. You know when flies come in the house? How many of y'all get flies come in the house? When, that's why you tell your kids, don't run in and out. You go out, stay out. Next time you go out, stay out. If you come back in, you're staying in. Because then flies come in and y'all know the flies came off the garbage can or out the dog poop. Then it's going to land on your food. Land on your head, land on your spoons, land on your toothbrush. Sin lies at the door, desiring to come on in and have you and lay little eggs and disgusting things around your life. It sounds nasty, but this is, this is how it operates. It's it ain't knocking. Sin ain't knocking. It's desiring. It's scheming. It's creeping. It's trying to have you. It want to own you. And so anyone who lets Jesus in, they get saved. They become hot. Anyone who lets sin in, uh, well, then they're going to perish, right? And they become cold. Here's the problem. Some people try to let in both. Try, trying to sup with Christ and sleep with sin. Take God at the dinner table and sin in the bedroom. Um, God publicly and sin intimately. And these, this idea that I can have both God and sin. Now, now, let me be clear. All have sinned and fall short of the glory. But all don't welcome sin. And there's a difference. All don't make sin a place in the house. All have sinned. So it's not saying if you sin and bring Jesus in, then you've tried to have both. But it's if you welcome both in. And a lot of people make room for the sin they enjoy. And you know what happens to them is they become lukewarm. Jesus is at the door specifically here in this scripture for the lukewarm Christian. We like to quote that scripture for all those who are just lost to God. But this is to the church. This letter was to the church. Uh, this was to, to all of those in, in the church in Laodicea. So now we're dealing with church folk or people who say they know God or they believe in God already. This is those lukewarm. Now, here's the thing about sin. Just because sin is wicked. How many of y'all know sin is wicked? does not mean that it presents itself as wicked. Doesn't mean it dresses up with wickedness. That's why when it comes to sin, the qualifier is not how something looks. If it's morally acceptable in society, 
if other people are okay with it. The appearance of a thing is not what qualifies sin, uh, not what others think about it. Here's the qualifier for sin. Does it separate you from God? Because that's what sin does. It separates us from God. And him who is the life, then we separate from that, and the, then the wages of that sin is death. So you got you to gotta look at things that separate you from God. Scripture says, for him who knows to do right in his heart and does it not, to him that is sin. Does it separate you from God? So there's things that God told you not to do, places God told you not to go, people God told you not to deal with, that you still maintain intimate links with or try to slide by or entertain. And, and when you do it, the, the, the guilt you feel on yourself has you then go hide from God. All sin ain't sex. All sin ain't drugs. Some sin is how you talk to people. Some sin is your pride. Some sin is your fear. Some sin deals with your lack of worship. Some sin deals with your inconsistency and unfaithfulness. Some sin deals with your lack of forgiveness just because you feel you're right. Some sin, sin is so much more. And for everyone who wants it to be simply black and white, yes, there is black and white in the scripture. But then there's that area that God puts on you. For him who knows to do right in his heart and does it not to him, that is sin. That's why scripture tells you work out your own salvation and fear and trembling. Because there's some things that you can get away with that I can't get away with. There's some things that are good for you but are sin for me. And, and this is where we get all of this religious doctrine from. Is that when people don't work out their own salvation and fear and trembling, when God convicts me of a thing, because it's too difficult for me to not do that thing while you get to do it, I preach it as a doctrine. So don't listen to this music, it's sin. Don't talk like this, it's sin. Don't wear these clothes, it's sin. And just because God specifically gave you a conviction because of the life you came out of, you want to preach it to everybody. That's why you got to hang about nine or ten loosely put together scriptures to make up the doctrine. And then this stuff becomes uh, 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 dogmatic in churches throughout the years. And, and then people are like, hey, uh, that's not in the Bible. And then we say that they're heretics. Um, so what separates you from God? Because it doesn't present as, evil, present as evil, what happens is it resides as acceptable. Because sin doesn't, certain sin does not present as evil, we allow it to reside as acceptable. It's okay for this thing because it's not evil. If you see me do this, you won't think I'm sinning. So it's not about what God said. It's about what you think. The problem is making that make sense because you have to mix a lie with the truth for that to make sense. Uh, if, 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 if I know that this thing is true and, and just because it don't look evil, I can play with it, then I got to take this truth, mix it with this lie. And when you mix a lot of truth with a little lie, all you get is a lie. That's, it, it doesn't become uh, almost true. It becomes always lie. People, and I think people struggle with that idea because they think if they tell you 95% truth that they should be looked at as someone with integrity. That if they tell you a 95% truth, if they preach a 95% truth, if they preach a half gospel, then they should be looked at as this is acceptable. But the scripture tells me when it comes to the gospel that I shouldn't add from it or take from it. Paul tells me if anyone comes preaching a gospel other than the one I preach, it's a doctrine of demons. Um, if, if, if someone that is your friend is, tells you 95% truth, they lie to you. If your spouse is faithful to you 95% of the time, they cheating on you. Jesus said a little leaven. Spoil the whole lump. I always say, if you take a little, 
a little poop <laughs> and put it in the cake batter. Just a, no, 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 no. Just a little bit. Y'all tripping. Y'all tripping. Just a, just a little bit. Un poquito. <laughs> just a little bit. Just take a, just take a small piece. Oh, all right, all right. Just something the size of a fingernail clipping. That's it. But then you mix it in. Look, there's a whole couple cups of sugar and butter and flour and eggs. You won't even taste it. Exactly. That's how the truth operates with a lie, right? And this is what people do, and they think because I get this much. No, you lukewarm. The truth, the truth that you believe affects your actions. The lies that you believe affect your actions. If you believe God is a healer, you live like God is a healer. If you believe every, every diagnosis that, the, that, the, that the, the doctor gives you, hey, listen, we're not against modern medicine, but we do understand pharmacia is sorcery. And that's why there is no medicine that is allowed to uh, heal anything. It's a pill for an ill. You take this, but this is going to make that worse. Uh, you get diagnosed with this, we can't, we can't give you nothing that's going to fix it, but we can, we can slice you, chemo you, or radiate you. Ain't nothing going to fix it, though. Yep. But there's stuff that fixes it. Yeah. So how come? If we live in that lie, it affects our actions. If we live in the truth, it affects our actions. Um, the actions that you, that you uh, live with long enough, they change your sight. This is what you start believing. The things that you live with long enough. And so if I, if, 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 if I believe these lies and then it affects these actions, if I do this stuff long enough, it changes what I see. Yeah. Yeah. Let me give you an example. Uh, the serpent comes into the garden. Says to Eve, did God say you couldn't have this stuff? She said, no, God said we can have all of it except the tree in the middle or we die. You won't die. Said, oh, she believes that. So she starts staring at the fruit and seeing that it's good for food, making men wise, pleasing to the eye. So then here's her action. She's staring at it. Now she eats it. Then her eyes were open, the Bible said. Then she knew that she was naked. Adam knew that he was naked. The actions were affected by what they believed, and that affected what they saw. Uh, this, is, this is what happens in people's relationships is they believe the lies that's sold to them by their by they newfound boyfriend or girlfriend or what's put on Instagram or Twitter in their DMs. They believe it. And so, uh, so they start operating within that relationship as if it's a real one. And no matter what you say, they don't see what you see. They don't see that they're getting catfished. They don't see that this person is a liar. They don't see that there's danger involved. They see, they see the perfect person, even if that person ain't there. It's like you really thought that supermodel was DMing you. <laughs> and you get over there and it's a 56-year-old uh, man with no teeth in his mouth. <laughs> it changes your perspective. Um, and then your sight affects, uh, your, sight affects your direction and, and your pursuit. Right? Because now at this point, uh, if you deal with Adam and Eve, they change walking to, from walking towards God to walking away from God. Yeah, yeah. It changes uh, their pursuit. It changes what they're after. And that's backwards. We start going backwards. Here's what scripture says. It says, because you say I'm rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, uh, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You think you got it together. And you don't. You think you rich, but you poor. You think, you think you got perfect vision and you're blind. You think you are clothed in an array of glory. This world sings your praises, but you are naked and in shame. And instead of pursuing that, God says you should pursue gold from me. This is what he says. Garments from me that are white as a raiment. That we should, uh, our, our, our comforts, when we get into them, what they do is they cause us to pray less. How do we pray for God's comfort and then that comfort cause us to seek God less? It's quiet in here. It's all right if I'm on your toes. Just amen like I'm on your neighbor's toes. 
like that's them, that's them. <laughs> but our comforts cause us to pray less. You don't pray often when things ain't broken. You don't, you don't pray often when everything's your way because you think, I don't really have need of nothing. Here's the, here's the thing, you don't pray because you have need. You pray because you are in a relationship with God. That folks become poor in spirit um, and clothed in shame with name brands. You can have all the name brands you want, and it's, and it's shame. It's shame of nakedness if you have not put on the garment of praise, if you have not put on a white garment for him that's been washed in his blood, that's been washed in the water of the word. You know, we, we really should be seeking his gold and his wisdom and anointing our eyes instead of entertaining our eyes all the time. Ain't nothing wrong with a little entertainment, but we do understand that entertainment means to hold captive. When she saw that the fruit was good for food, saw that it was good for making men wise. When she saw that it was pleasing to the eyes, she ain't go nowhere else. That, that viewpoint had her captive. It, here's what it looks like. Here's what it looks like in modern day. Uh, you get a symptom. What you do? You Google it. How many of y'all Google your symptoms? I see three honest folks. Everybody else in here lying. How many of y'all used to Google y'all stuff? Because when you Google it, you're dead. The first line says, how are you reading this? You are dead. <laughs> it's death is uh, runny nose, you're dying. Ashy hands, you're dying. Breath stink, dead. You are dead. <laughs> Any symptom. You are dead. <laughs> Stretch marks, woo, you're dying. <laughs> but what happens when we start doing this is we can't get away from it. We, we're like, oh, man, that's bad. Hopefully it's the next one. Boom. <laughs> oh, okay, that's a little better. I ain't so dead on that one. What's the next one? And, and then you don't believe that one, so you got to go to the next website and see if they confirm it. So then you get off of Google and get on DuckDuckGo, and hopefully they was hiding something on Google. That gave you, and there, 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 there. And your eyes have held you captive. He says, why don't you anoint your eyes with eye salve, eye salve that you would see. And you've been, this entertainment that we, this captivity we're in, um, Netflix, Hulu, our, our, our eyes have cost us money. Unduly spent, right? Hulu, Prime, uh, Paramount, Netflix, Stars. How many of y'all paying for subscriptions? When the last time you bought a Bible? Just, just inquiring. Lukewarm. Don't worry, it's gonna get good. I know, I know y'all mad. Y'all like, come on, preach to me like I'm hot. <laughs> Lukewarm. Somebody say lukewarm. lukewarm. One foot in, one foot out. That's how we live it. One foot in, one foot out. Do you know that, that you can assist with the temperature of somebody else? See, see, this is what I don't, I don't like about the modern church. And I love the church. I love the church. Just not the modern church. Just like I love women, just not the modern woman, just her, my wife, and all my sisters in Christ as sisters. I love the idea of women as created by God. <laughs> this is my wife. Come here, baby. Come here. Come here. Let the internet see you. Let the internet see you. Let the internet see you. Come on up here. Can I say it now? Can I preach the gospel now? All right. <laughs> like, I love women, but not the modern woman. The modern woman is the woman that don't need no man. The modern woman is the woman who, 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 who got to march for everything and compete with a man and, and, and has, has a problem um, really being equal to a man. It has to dominate the man. Can't submit to leadership. It's all right. It's all right, ladies. 
This is, this is the problem in the modern world. The, the, the modern world has, has created a competitive market, so homes are divided all the time. So the man got to learn how to do the duties uh, 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 of a woman and emasculate himself in order to make the relationship work. Gotta, gotta hold my tongue for everything. Talk super soft about everything. Make sure I'm concerned about every detail or feelings in everything. Make sure that I, I, I uphold you as master in everything. Or the house don't work. So, so what we have in the modern woman is she wants a eunuch, not a husband. The modern church is the same way. They want a eunuch God. They don't want a commanding God. They don't want a, a, a God that holds accountable. They don't want a God that, that chastises those that he loves. They don't want a God that rebukes or reproves. They don't want a God of authority. They want a God that pacifies them, that says yes to their every will, yes to their every way, yes to their suggestion, that's waiting on them to come home from the club. Hope, hope you get in early tonight. Maybe you'll talk to me or crack this Bible open. But if you don't, grace, grace, grace for you. No, no, no. He vomit us out of his mouth. Someone taught you wrong. This modern church uh, has also taught us that everything is about us. That, that my lukewarmity is only about my lukewarmity. That my prosperity is only about my prosperity. That my, my strength in God is only about my strength in God. The problem is the word church in the New Testament means the gathering. It means coming out of where you are to gather together. It is the body of Christ. It is not you and you are not the church. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. But when it comes to being the church, that's all of us together. You ain't the church by yourself. The modern church has taught you that lie because you don't want to submit to authority. You want the unit God. The modern church has told us it's all about us. I'm going to tell you different. I'm going to tell you because God has placed in the body how he sees fit and every joint supplies Right? We all do our part that I and you have the ability to check the temperature of somebody else. All right. All right. Paul said this to Timothy, fan in the flames, the gift of God that's within you. He saw Timothy needing some encouragement. He said, he said God didn't give you a spirit of fear, Timothy. God gave you a, a spirit of love and power and a sound mind. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, Timothy. He said, God has made you kings and priests, Timothy. He said, the faith that was in your mother was also in your grandmother, and I'm convinced it's in you, Timothy. He said, Timothy, go out there and preach the word. Rebuke, reprove, and edify. Timothy, be ready in season and out of season to give an answer for the hope that is within you. Paul held Timothy accountable to his his heat. See, see, we don't, we don't like to hold folks accountable. You, that, that, that's, that chapter I read in 1 Corinthians, I started, it's chapter 1, I started in verse 18. Let me read you verse 10 and 11. This is, this is the letter Paul's writing. He said, now I plead with you, brethren, by the, name of our, uh, by, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's house, that there are contentions among you. Chloe was like, Pastor Paul, uh, they acting up in here. It's contentions among them. There's divisions. You should hear what they're saying. This one's saying this, this one's saying this, and it's causing problems in the church. Paul said, it's been brought to my attention by those in Chloe's house that there's contentions among you. You know, we all love our secrets. We love to keep our secrets to the body's demise. Um, we don't, we don't want to tell nobody's business. We don't want to tell where nobody's at. Lose confidence and trust and all this stuff. Romans chapter two, uh, verse 16 says, 
in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to the gospel, period, letting us know that God's going to judge our secrets. So you can try to keep people's secrets so they can stay in them, or you can help them so they can get free of them because they're going to be judged by them. Here, let me, let me, let me say it a little more like this. Um, because, because the last generation, our parents, right, they had a thing about the doctor. They would go to the doctor, and at least black folks, I can't speak for everybody, but black folks in the last generation would go to the doctor and would not tell you something was wrong with them. They'd come home with their diagnosis and they would not tell the family. The doctor would tell them they have this disease or this cancer or this thing, and they would not tell the, the family. And they would sit there and let it eat them alive. And the children wouldn't find out about the diagnosis until the deathbed when, the, when they can't respond no more and the doctor got to talk to somebody else. That, that this is what happens in the church is that you understand that if this thing is kept secret, it's going to devour the body. Sin that is kept secret is a snare. That's what the Bible tells us to confess our sins one to another and pray for each other that we will be healed. Because it's a snare. Um, one relationship in this body is not priority over bodily health. You know, pastors should be able to say, like Paul said, listen, it's been brought to me by those in this house that there's some contention among you. Here, I, I heard you had a problem with something that we're doing. Well, why are you whispering it in the corner to the other members trying to get a committee? Why you ain't brought it to me? I heard, I heard you've been struggling with this thing, but you don't, but why, 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 why are you whispering it around and got people keeping secrets and, and personal prophecy and prayer meetings in the corner and, and, and then going to be mad that the pastors didn't check on you? Heard there was contentions among you. Yo, I heard this one was sleeping with that one. Heard this in the youth group. Now, I ain't going to say nothing to that youth, but parent, where are you? How is it that we know all the dangers in the body, but we keep them secret so that they can kill the body in our lukewarmity? When you got the ability to help somebody else with their heat, you trying to keep that relationship, but you ain't got the anointing for them to get free. They're stronger than you. That's why they brought you into their sickness, and they still sick, and you still quiet. Now, you don't trust God the same way they didn't trust God. So you become inconsistent. You become frustrated. You start questioning. Then your marriage become a wreck, but can't nobody come and tell on you? Because house business is house business. No, 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 this is bodily function. See, this, this, hurt, this should hurt your feelings because I'm sure everybody in here got a secret for somebody in here. I said every church. You know a real friend would never ask you to kill yourself or hurt your own body? If a friend said to you, hey, kill yourself, they wouldn't be a friend, would they? Well, that's, that's, that's the relationship you're protecting when what they are holding will destroy the body of Christ. Paul, Paul was able um, to get back in and, and check the temperature because he was made aware of the condition of the flock. See, see we, 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 we'll, we'll say, why ain't this moving right? And why ain't that moving right? Well, you can't compare the fire that's on the prayer team as the general temperature of the body and say, why ain't this happening? You can't compare the fire from the pulpit to the general temperature of the body and say, why ain't this happening? You can't compare the fire of the drummer that the roof fell in on him and he held it up with one hand and banged them drums with the other hand with the general temperature of the body. Where are you at? <laughs> y'all didn't know I could act and stuff, did y'all? 
If we play charades, we will win. <laughs> so it's two groups of people. It's two groups of people that we see here, right? Um, while, and while they're described as Jews and Greeks, the real breakdown is that there are those who are seeking a sign and those who think it's foolishness. When you, when you deal with this gospel and you bring this message to people, you got two groups of people uh, that are rejected. One is those who want a sign. Prove it. Prove it. Do this or do that. And then you have the other group that won't receive it, which says, that's stupid. That's foolishness. How is God there in what's in outer space? Whatever else they say. Right? And so you got these, these two groups. Some think you're fools and some want you to prove it. Both of them are like fish, unaware of the existence of water. In a sense that the things we don't see are more real than the things we do see. We are surrounded by, in, by the spiritual realm. We are a spiritual being. We, 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 we are flesh and bone, but God put his spirit in us. So what we bind on earth is bound in heaven. These people don't see anything spiritual. They are like fish that are unsure, unaware of the existence of the water they swim in. They just think that that's normal, that this is normal. This is how we move around. Um, both of them are perishing. Both are perishing. Because if you reject the word, you perish it, right? And, and so, so when it comes down to this, you shouldn't be angry at somebody who rejects your message. You know why? They're perishing. You really should pity them. Um, you shouldn't be intimidated to give the message to anybody or for, by anyone who rejects. You shouldn't be intimidated because, because they're drowning and don't know it. You know, if someone was drowning, no matter how big they are, tattooed up they are, no matter what ambulance they got around their neck and, and, and sage they burning and, and, and whatever, and you standing on the dock and they're drowning, you're not scared of them. And they can yell all type of vile things at you and, and, and tell you, I don't want your help. And, ah, 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 ah. I don't have to be intimidated by anybody drowning. I'm on sure footing. I'm, 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 I, no matter how big you are, I'm not scared because the foolishness of God is wiser than men's wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than men's strength and I'm watching you fall, watching you die. My heart is breaking for you. I'm not scared of you. You know, let me get some keys, Mike. Let me get some keys. I think I'm going to take this thing on out. I've been, I've, been, I've been preaching slow because the translation is going on. And Lucas is in Aruba, and I don't know who's translating it. If the, oh, yes, he is on there? Oh, let me do my thing. We could have been done. <laughs> I'm talking slow because I, I didn't know who was on there. All right, here we go. So how many of y'all know <laughs> that God uses the misfit? I'm, 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 trying, I'm trying to, so, so you know where the message is at, I'm trying to get you out of this lukewarm place, into this place of fire, right? Where, the, where, where it's like fire shut up in your bones, where you fan it into flames, where you come to a boil, where my heat makes you boil. You know, you know the word there um, for hot and cold? One word for hot in the Greek is fervent. One word for cold is sluggish. So, so, so be fervent or be lazy, but don't dance in between pretending to be one when you're the other, right? Fill the church on Resurrection Sunday and it's gone the next week. Can't wait till Super Bowl Sunday, but you're gone the next week. Mother's Day, you here, but you gone the next week. No, 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 no. Let me tell you, there's a saying in this world that your actions speak louder than your words. So, so you gave a loud, wordy invite to a special service, but your actions say unfaithfulness is accepted in the house. 
Yeah, yes, he is on there. I'm going to do my thing. Right? So, so God chooses the misfit. He uses the misfit. You know what the lie of this world is? The lie of this world is you got to be perfect. The lie of this world is you got to be perfect to serve God, perfect to go to church. This lie has penetrated the culture so deep that people won't come because they don't got the right outfit to put on. This lie has penetrated so deep that people feel like when I get right, I'll go to church. No, you go to church to find God so he can get you right. Lazarus came out the tomb wrapped in the dead clothes. He ain't say, wait till he get his life together before he come out the grave. No, you got to get here. But that's the lie that is believed. The lie that is believed is it's only perfect people in there. Therefore, when the pastor sin or you sin, the church is just filled with hypocrites. You can't believe them. No, no, no. Nobody here is perfect. Jesus said that it's the sick that need a hospital, not the well. So if we in here, in his presence, it's because we are a disaster before we came to his feet. Uh, this, this lie that, that, that the world puts out, you know, you know that's not the truth. You know who really wants the perfect? The world. You know who you really got to be perfect to be a part of? The world. Now, I know, li listen, listen, unless you really ever looked at it, you might have just looked over it. You know, Nebuchadnezzar told his people, go bring me 200 of the princes, 200 of the nobles, 200 of the good looking and the influential, the musicians. Bring me those who got influence in the people. 200 of them. Don't bring me the bums. Don't bring me the ugly. Don't bring me the regulars. Don't bring me those who can't do nothing. Don't bring me, don't bring me those. Bring me Gaston and Belle. <laughs> Y'all like that? <laughs> bring, me, bring me the best of the best. You know, it's the world that rewards the good old boys. You got to have the right bloodline to get the right promotion. Uh, 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 this one's related to that one. This judge appointed that judge appointed that judge. Let me tell you something. If you ain't in the bloodline, you ain't getting the spot. Because it's this world that, that rewards its perfection. Uh, this world rewards you according to looks. If you look good, you get the promotion. If you look good, you get the followers. You look good, uh, uh, people like you. They're nicer. It's this world that rewards you according to your talent and your influence. Right, if you can do something, I'll use you. I'll hire you. I'll, I, 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 I'll put you on. If you got influence, we'll pay you to wear our clothes. We're going we're gonna to manipulate that. So now once we pay you to wear our clothes or to use your talent, you can't speak the truth anymore because it ruins our brand. And we have branded you. We own you. You are cattle. Um, it's this world that will cancel you based on your past. Not the church. This world will tell you that who you were yesterday affects who you are today. This world will tell you if you're a felon, you can't get a job, you can't vote, and you can't own a gun. It's this world that will tell you that whatever you tweeted 10 years ago can devour your living today. It's this world that will tell you that, 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 that you, you used to be loose, so you ain't going to make a good wife. He was a dog, he ain't going to make a good husband. It's this world that says this stuff. It's this world that sends you on a mission for the perfected image. You gotta wear the right clothes, wear the right shoes, have the right body type, say the right thing, have the right etiquette for your social media. Don't get too far into politics. Don't go too far into this. Uh, you gotta have political correctness. This world sends you on a mission for a perfected image. But it's God that tells you to pursue his perfected image. That you, you are broken. That you are a mess. That you are foolish. That you are weak. But he chose you. The real question is, where, wh what were you before? Where, where did he find you? Because he uses the misfit. Not many of us were noble. Not many of us were princes. Not many of us were wise. But God chose the foolishness of this world. 
He chose the debased and despised thing to preach his gospel. He chose the weak things of this world to confine the strong. He chose the foolish things to confine the wise. Where did he find you at? You know, if, if you're hot, you'll be welcomed in. This is the danger. If you're cold, then you receive the wrath. But being lukewarm, well, he says, I wish you would be one or the other. Because if you're lukewarm, he's going to have to look you in your face and tell you, I know you think you know me. But I never knew you. And deal with your argument. I cast out demons in your name, though, and I, and I prophesied in your name, and I, I went to church, and, and, and I sat there, and, and I liked to hear the word. It made me feel better. When I left, I felt better. Here's my church's name. We sang 23 minutes of worship. We did, did an offering. They preached a good 30-minute presentation. It was really nice. We was home in an hour. I gave you the best hour on Sunday. And he says, I never knew you. Now he's got to spew you out. You tried to get up in, and he's got to get you out. So, so God's preference is that you would be hot or cold, so he ain't got to deal with looking you in the eyes, knowing that he loves you and tell you he don't know you. But the message of the cross, not a cross, the cross. The message of the cross, while it's foolishness to those who don't believe to us who are being saved by it, it is the very power of God. It's the message of the cross. It's not a cross. It's not your necklace. Your necklace is not the gospel. Your bumper sticker is not the gospel. Your tattoo is not the gospel. So much so we ain't supposed to even have graven images, the Bible says. That picture, that wooden thing that you hold up and if a vampire came in, you would think that you would hold it up. No, it ain't of a cross. It's of his cross. It, it's his cross that was bloodstained. It was his cross that brought the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world and laid him out spread before God taking the beating for your sin it was that blood-stained cross that is that message is the very power of God that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever will believe in him would not die but have everlasting life let me tell you something you were sinning I was sinning you were lost I was lost we didn't even know we were lost we were like the blind following the blind into a ditch we loved our ditch we loved living with nothing being told we had everything doing all types of wrong being far from God thinking that we knew him and then one day he stood he stood on the door and knocked he hung on the cross and called and if anyone would hear his voice he said my sheep my sheep they know my voice and the voice of another they will not follow but they would open up to me I would come in I would come in and I would sup with them I would dine with them and them with me and I would sit them with me in my throne and they would overcome and so when he overcame the grave and he overcame death he brought you to overcome it too you don't have to be a stranger you don't have to be a foreigner let me tell you what the cross did for you this is not an Easter message this is the message and when you are no longer ashamed of your nakedness he says there because you think you got it together but you really are ashamed of nakedness when you're no longer ashamed of your nakedness then you will preach that cross differently you will present that cross differently to somebody let me tell you something I ain't perfect I ain't never been perfect everything in my past ain't good to talk about but I talk about it because somebody else is still there Somebody else is still there and they need to know that the difference between me today and me being where they are right now was simply the cross. 
that I didn't have to run a marathon or learn a trade. I didn't have to get a degree. I just had to get to the cross, that the cross was the difference maker. And when you're no longer ashamed of your nakedness, when you're no longer ashamed of the divorce you went through, when you really get healed of it and can let it go and you've got power of it, when you're no longer ashamed of the bankruptcy you had to file because you messed some things up, then you will preach that cross as God saw you when you were down and he picked you up. When, when you're no longer ashamed of that rape or that molestation that you had to endure when you were young, when, when, when you're no longer ashamed of the mugshot that you hope that nobody ever Googles about you, when you are no longer ashamed of the addiction that you came up out of or, or the depression that you used to suffer with or, or the idol worship that you were bound up to, when you are no longer ashamed of the witchcraft that you used to research and think was true and called it God, when you're no longer ashamed of that abortion that you had when you didn't know no better and God did, you didn't know God back then or, or, or the second sexual deviance that you have used to live in when you're no longer ashamed of the things that God delivered you from because there is no condemnation in Christ but we are justified in him and you realize that all have sinned and fallen short then you bring that message different you realize that that none are wise and, and none are noble and, and, and none are of good report that, that, that it don't matter if you think you got it together God didn't choose those who think they got it together he didn't choose those that are high and lifted up. He chose those that have been beaten and broken. The foolish things, the weak things, the base things, the despised things. Because he knew that you would not steal his glory. He knew that because if it was not for him who was on your side, where would you be? And so when you step up into it, he knows you're going to give him the praise and not take the credit for yourself. He knows that you're going to acknowledge Jesus in the middle of it. He knows knows that you're going to preach it everywhere and he's going to be there to help you and work with you and confirm it with signs. See, when I step in thinking I was good before I showed up, thinking that I worked my way up into this thing, that I was smart enough to earn this, rich enough to buy this, connected enough to work this out and network it, then I ain't going to give him no praise. understand how we can settle in lukewarmity knowing what he brought us out of how are you just as hot in your salvation as you was in your sin how did the temperature not change how did the cross not change you how did the cross not bring you up how did the cross not bring you out the cross was not for behavior modification. The cross was for salvation, deliverance, and healing. That on one side of the cross there was death, but on the other side there was life. On, on one side there was drought, but on the other side there were rivers of living water. On one side of the cross there was sin, but on the other side there was righteousness in him. On one side I was a slave. On the other side I'm a son and I'm free. On one side I was bound up, but on this side I was set free. On this side I I was sick and bound with infirmity but on this side of the cross there was healing on this side of the cross I was subject to what others would lead me to and say but on this side whatever I bind on earth is bound in heaven and whatever I loose on earth is loosed in heaven on this side I was condemned for eternity but on this side I sit with him in heavenly places I reign with him in his throne and I don't know how I can be on this side and be the same temperature I was on that side I don't know how I can understand his grace and mercy and live as if I don't have it understand his healing and never tell anybody about it understand his faithfulness and live like he has left me or forsaken me I don't understand they preach the gospel everywhere the Lord working with them and signs confirming the word. We in the last days. Let me tell you something. Everything has increased. Listen to me. Everything has increased. Knowledge has increased, the Bible says. God shortened these days because we wouldn't survive them. Violence has increased. 
wickedness has increased, sickness has increased, death has increased, all these rates have risen, poverty has increased. How is it in a world that is supposed to be richer now, more advanced now, more scientifically developed now? Is the world worse off than it has ever been? I'll tell you why. Because the world moans in birth pains, in labor pains, the Bible says, that the creation was made subject to frustration not willingly, but by him who subjected it and hoped that they would be saved. It says they are waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God to be revealed. Will you not reveal yourself? Let me ask those in the room um, who God has spoken to about your particular calling and the gifts of the spirit that you operate in. Is there anybody in the room that says, I know that God deals with me through the gift of healing? Anybody? Come up here. Come up here. Come up here. That doesn't mean that you had to be healed from something. It just means that the Holy Spirit operates through you with the gift of healing. There's a lie that we believe that we have had to be sick to operate in the gift of healing. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. I saw you lift your hand. Don't sit down all shy now. Why are you trying to be shy? Y'all come over here. Prayer team. I need the prayer team down here too. What y'all doing? Look at that. They, don't, they come down here bowing and holding hands. <laughs> I ain't finna lay hands on y'all. We finna lay hands together. I got a brother in the house. We want to pray for. We want to pray for you, brother. We um. Where's the oil at? says in scripture is by your faith that you're healed the fact that you showed up says you have faith to be healed we believe every part of scripture that he knit your body together in the secret place and he saw it he saw it while it was yet unformed that he makes no mistakes and he knows all of your days all of your days not one day would be taken. In the name of Jesus, 
in the name of Jesus I declare healing over your body I declare life and that life more abundantly in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus all throughout your body that his blood would flow through your blood, correcting every error, bringing everything that is out of order into order. I bind up cancer. I cancel the assignment. I curse it at its core. I curse death at its core in Jesus mighty name. And I declare that every cancer cell has to leave. The spirit of infirmity has to leave now in the mighty name of Jesus. I declare that you are whole and healed and healthy even now that the power of God and the spirit of God would flow through your body bringing everything, bringing everything back to how he created you in the secret place in his image. There is no sickness in his image. So in Jesus name, in Jesus name I speak healing. In Jesus name right now Oh, Father, I break the power of the lie. I break the power of the diagnosis. I break every word that, that every doctor has spoken that has tried to condemn this man. I say get up and walk in Jesus' name. I say that life is before you in Jesus' name. I say that not one day will be stolen in Jesus' name. God, restore his strength. Restore his strength. Restore his joy. Restore his peace in Jesus' name. Break the heaviness of depression off of him right now in the name of Jesus. I come against the spirit of fear in Jesus' name. Father, I declare, God, that, that you would put people around him that would support him in faith, praying for him, declaring life over him in Jesus' mighty name. And God, restore the years that were stolen. Restore the years that were stolen. Father, restore the strength that was stolen, God. Reverse the, the actions of every medication that has done detriment to his body, God. Not just the cancer, but his kidneys. Father, not just his kidneys, but his liver. In Jesus' mighty name. God, we believe. You said we're too touch and agree. Asking anything in your name that it would not be held back. Release it, God. You said whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Father, bind life to him in Jesus' name. Bind healing to him in Jesus' name. Bind a refreshing to him in Jesus' name. I command cancer to loose its grip. Sickness to loose its grip.
somebody love on the Father? He is a mighty God, a righteous God, a healing God. And we thank him for visiting us today in this service. What a beautiful time that it's been, just even in this moment. And what a perfect moment it is to continue in worship and our giving. Because we know and we believe here at Square Root Church that giving is an act of worship. It is our yes to him. It is our obedience to him. Anybody want to say yes today? Anybody have an obedient heart and say yes? We say yes to you, our, oh God, in our tithes and offering. When you walked in here today, you received an envelope. And I would love for everyone to have an envelope in their hand. Even if you give a different way or you already gave or whatever happened, can we just be in unity and have a moment of solidarity today where we give today when two and three touch in agreement, nothing's held back. Nothing's held back. Even his promise and his covenant with us, nothing is held back. So there's several ways that you can give. Cash app is the easiest one. And I say it all the time, it's convenient, but it's not casual. What we're doing is being received in heaven. The very throne room of God is receiving our worship and our yes today. So I ask that you would do it with a cheerful heart because it's only because of him in the first place that we even have access to wealth, that we have access to our finances, that he sustained us and kept us with a roof over our head. There's no one in here who is homeless because he's kept you. There's no one in here that didn't have transportation today because he's kept you. He is a keeper. And Father, today we bless you because of that. We love you and we honor you. And we are so grateful to be in this covenant relationship with you because you are the God that holds nothing back, that you have no restriction, that your hand is not short, that you're not slack concerning your promises towards your people. So we give today liberally, God, knowing that in your hands we can trust you, that when we give it to you, that you'll do exceedingly, abundantly, above anything that we could ask, anything that we could imagine, anything that we could make up, because you're just that type of God. So we trust you with it and we give it to you, God. And we thank you, God, what a mighty God you are, that you're able to do what you do in Jesus' name. Can you thank him and love on him and clap to him as you give? Hello, Square Root family. It seems to me that every time you and I are together, something special happens when we gather around the word of God. I'm gonna be with you next Sunday morning right here at Square Root Church, and I'm looking forward to seeing you. I have something that I wanna to deliver to you, the impartation of the Spirit of God, and a word that I believe from the Lord is gonna come into your life. You know, over these last years, people have experienced so many different things, but there's a certainty in the Word of God. Your great pastors, the Rioses, have been leading you strong and sure, and I'm coming to add my voice, my heart, with your voice, and your heart right here at Square Root Church next Sunday morning. I wouldn't miss it if I was you.